I'm Katherine Colbert, and I'm the uh, director of the Athena Center for Leadership Studies here at Barnard. And um, actually, this is my most favorite thing in the whole world to do, which is to showcase the great minds of Barnard, uh, the kids who just have excelled and done so well, and most of all, participate in all of our programs. So what I thought we would do today is just talk a little bit with all of them as a conversation together um, about their experiences as Athena scholars. Now, you might think we have planned this all out. I promised only that I would ask lots of questions, um, and so they didn't get a chance to know what they are before this opportunity to speak. So uh, if they take a few minutes to think about them, that's part of the conversation. So let me introduce our guests to you. Uh, on my uh, far left, we have Dorothy Kadar. Uh, Dorothy is a new graduate. Uh, <laughs> is an al she is an alumna of uh, Barnard College. Alum alum alumni. Nay. Alumna. alumna. Yeah, I was right. Okay. Uh, she majored in political science, was an Athena Summer Fellow, uh, and served as a resident assistant at Barnard for three years. Uh, she interned at several reproductive rights organizations doing, during college, including one that I started, which we love. Um, and her senior thesis was entitled From Great Society to Welfare Society, The Impact of Race and Republicans on the Changing Democratic Vision of Welfare from Johnson to Clinton. Uh, she, a very short <laughs> title, exactly. Uh, and Dorothy plans on working in politics post-graduation. So now. Uh, we also have on my left Nina Aju Ahuja. Uh, Nina is a, uh, also an alumna of Barnard College, uh, a very recent alumna of Barnard College. She majored in economics, minored in psychology. Uh, she was an Athena Center intern uh, right after her sophomore year and an Athena Center uh, summer fellow after her junior year. As a summer fellow, she interned at Chan uh, Chanel, uh, was accepted into the uh, Fashion Draft New York City postgraduate program, which places students in various fashion-related industries throughout the city. And she'll be working uh, at Saks Fifth Avenue's executive training program as an assistant selling manager uh, come the fall. So uh, we're thrilled to have Nina with us. On my far right is another alumna of uh, Barnard College, but she actually is a graduate of the class of 2011. I'm on my lunch break. <laughs> uh, Rennie Callister graduated last year as a history major with a concentration in family, gender, and sexuality. She was the president of her class for three years and was the recipient of the Bryson Prize awarded to the Barnard senior who, in the opinion of the class, has given conspicuous evidence of unselfishness and who's made a greatest, uh, the greatest contribution to Barnard during her college years. Uh, she is currently a development assistant at the ASPCA. And uh, I have to tell you, it's uh, just fabulous. We're thrilled to have Rennie back with us. And to my immediate right is Eva Schneider, who is a rising senior. Uh, who is majoring in political science and a 2012 fellow at the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress. She would like to pursue a career in environmental policy and will be interning at the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance this summer. She's also, this is the, the little known fact here, taught tap dancing to elementary school children for a number of years. And I don't know if we can get her to tap dance today, but. Um, <laughs> perhaps as part of the panel or, or some other, uh, as part of the entertainment for the ice cream social that follows. <laughs> How's that? So let me start by asking you all uh, how you, after coming through or in the midst of the Athena program, how you define leadership and has, how has your view of it changed since being in the program? So let's just do this way that back and forth a little bit. Dorothy, why don't you start? <laughs> okay. Um, hello. Thank you guys for coming. I would have to say my view of leadership, I've always um, sought out roles of leadership my entire life. I've just always been that person who's the first to raise their hand because no one else is, and I figure, you know, I'll do it the best anyway. And, you know, I kind of was always 
rushing to get things done. And I think being a part of the uh, Athena program taught me that leadership isn't about always being the loudest person in the room. It isn't always about being the person who has that kind of like innate confidence and that these things can be learned and that it's actually a more delicate role being a leader than it is actually being, you know, that bull who kind of gets everything done. I think that helps at certain times, but I think it's also, um, you know, really actually listening to what people are saying and um, taking that into account and um, being more delicate, I think, is something that I really learned from the Athena program as opposed to um, kind of that more natural um, leadership that I think I always thought was my, you know, leadership abilities was, you know, being able to speak loud and stand up and, you know, whistle so that everybody's <laughs> paying attention to you. Um, and there's much more to that. Um, so negotiating the two, I think, is the most essential. Ready? I would agree. Before school or before the Athena Center, it was more of a I can stand at the front of the room and conduct this, but through my studies, I learned that it was more of a motivational process and that being a good leader is about being a motivator and it's not about you. At the end of the day, it's about the people who you're working with. And especially in the working world, I've come to that because I'm a, I'm a recent graduate and you know I'm not the chair of any committee that I'm speaking on, um, but you can still be a leader even in you know as an assistant, even as a host at a restaurant. It's the way of putting yourself out there and showing the rest of your team that you can be counted on um, and really finding everyone else's motivation in that. So, And through my studies, I, I created a workshop, a leadership workshop that I actually continue to use and will use again this summer as a, an adventure tour guide. So I mean, basically in any facility, the, the Athena Leadership Center has really taught me a lot about my own leadership ability and my ability to influence others. Eva? Um, I guess. For me, one of the greatest learning experiences was this year when I took Women in Leadership, where we actually got to study all of the different kinds of leadership, and it finally dawned on me that there isn't one type of leadership, and I think that that's really crucial, especially as a, a woman going into the, a workplace or in terms of if you want to have any kind of career, to know that it, there isn't just one type, and that you can mold your own style of leadership based on what you're most, most comfortable with. So I'm not a person that, you know, wants to stand in front of the room and, you know, be really loud. That's not my style of leadership, but I'm more, I've noticed um, more one-on-one. -on -one. I'm better with that and, you know, in terms of motivating my students, it's, you know, it's all of those kind of things that the, the intricate parts of leadership that don't really get talked about um, because we have this male stereotype of the really loud, mm. you know, aggressive person, so. Nina. Yeah. Um, I think that for me, I agree with what they're saying. I think a lot of it was a difference of perception. Um, coming into college, I definitely thought that leadership was about um, getting things done and was about the product rather than the process. And I think that the Athena program taught me more that it was what was happening along the way also. That was a really important aspect of leadership. Um, for example, <laughs> I was in a class freshman year. Um, it was a general lecture. There was about 200 people in it. We were split up into groups. And no one pretty much did anything until the very last day. And that was a point at which I basically wrote the whole paper for everybody, and we split the grade. And it was an awful experience, and it was one I'll never forget. Um, and I think that you know, at the end of the day, we got an A on the paper, but that was an awful example of leadership because <laughs> the product might have been fine, but the process was just traumatic. And I think that um, to be a good leader, especially in group situations, it's also about what happens along the way, you know, that you're not hurting people, that you're helping people, that you're producing, um, you know, quality, whatever sub substance of whatever that you're doing um, and everyone's contributing and getting people to contribute I think is a really important aspect of leadership that I hadn't realized until I was part of the program. So just uh, some of you are familiar with the Athena program and others of you aren't so let me just give you a quick recap of what we what we do. We have now 165 Barnard students participating in the program. <laughs> they are required to take uh, five courses, two of which are required. Uh, one is Women in Leadership, uh, which is the, uh, the first course, or often the first course that they take. Uh, and the last is a senior seminar that focuses on the students doing a social action project. In between, they can take any of three electives that really focus on both the study of gender and, and 
what gender means both in the work life and other parts of the world. Uh, so the understanding how gender operates and understanding uh, the study of organizations, how do organizations change, how do organizations work, uh, and, and looking very holistically at leadership in both of those lenses. Uh, all of the courses are uh, taken from existing coursework within the college already. So it could be an, a sociology course or a psychology course, or it could be a dance course or any of the other uh, activities that are or coursework that's offered in any of those different departments. In addition, uh, each of the scholars has to do an internship uh, with in a work environment uh, that we approve. They have to do, uh, as I said in the senior seminar, a social action project, and they have to take at least three workshops in what we call the Athena Leadership Lab, which is a group of uh, essentially professional development types of programs uh, that focus in seven areas, communication, negotiation, uh, technology, entrepreneurship, uh, management, uh, I'm going to forget the, financial fluency, <laughs> and there's one more. Yes, an area we call risk taking and resilience. And basically there's somewhere around 65 of these workshops offered to students during the course of the semester, or during the course of a year, and uh, both Athena Scholars and any Bar Barnard student are eligible to take those workshops uh, without cost to them. So it's, a, it's an interesting opportunity. So I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about these different components because each of you have done different things. And let me start with your internships because in fact, um, Barnard offers lots of internships to students. I would say almost every Bar Barnard student has an internship during the course of their uh, career here at Barnard, at least one, if not 10, because some uh, students really overdo it and, and go to lots and lots of different uh, work environments. Uh, talk a little bit about what um, you did in your internships and what difference it made in terms of your views of leadership. Should I go first? You should go first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I uh, worked at Chanel uh, full time um, over the summer, and I was also part of the um, Athena Summer Fellowship at the same time. So I got to live with a lot of the fellows, and that was a great experience. And I was working um, five days a week um, from nine to seven every day um, in retail planning and merchandising uh, for the US Wine and Guam. That's what, what my category was. And um, it was one of the most brutal experiences <laughs> of my life. I wrote a paper on it in the um, senior seminar that was called My Biggest Failure. Um, it was a very much a Devil Wears Prada situation. It's exactly what you think it's like. And um, I had a really hard time figuring out how to be heard and how to be judged based on my mental capability. That was one of the most difficult situations I've ever been in because at Barnard, usually, you know, and throughout my entire life in school, you know, we're all you know, overachieving students, we like the gold stars, we like the A pluses, and we like to see reward for the work that we're putting in. And usually we are really rewarded for it, and it's something that we're used to. And in that job, it was very thankless. I was not really um, talked to a lot at all, and it was a really difficult situation to basically get reciprocated, you know, to get any kind of feedback, to get good um, criticism, anything. Um, and I had to really learn how to put myself out there constantly and you know, not really take it to heart and not take it personally. And how to really change my affect in that situation. And that was one of the best leadership experiences of my life because I think that it was totally outside of the Barnard world. Um, but at the same time, I could come back at night and talk to my friends and talk to the other summer fellows who were going through similar situations and were helping me through my summer there. All right. Uh Renny. Sure. I think I was, I was the year before you came in or two, and I remember sitting with Professor Colbert and just being furious about the, the program that used to exist because I didn't understand what I was supposed to do with the internships and all of that other stuff, but I, Barnard did help me with connections to get these great internships that happened to be in a male-dominated world of comedy. I did the Colbert Report where I washed dogs and actually had to capture flies and I mean all sorts of weird things that you never expect to do in an internship but it really taught me to work with a group of people uh, with 13 other interns and you know to, to lead that adventure. Um, then I was at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater and that again was male dominated completely. There were probably two women in the office and 
one of my jobs was to create an after party space for one of our, uh, our huge improv marathons. So I had to gut and refurbish an old restaurant with the help of one man who was five foot two. So the <laughs> two of us together led that endeavor and you know, like it was thankless, but then again, it was a great learning experience that I can organize this just as an intern, just as someone you know, the general manager is telling me, did you do it yet? Like, oh my God, it's two months, I have scars everywhere, paint <laughs> on all my clothes, yes, it's done. Um, and I mean, that's gone on to help me in my world of comedy and got a lot of uh, credit for that as well. So it was great, great experience. So Eva. Um, well, last summer I interned for Christine Quinn. It was actually a fundraising group that their clients were Christine Quinn and Cyrus Vance, um, who's running for DA. And um, I had a great experience working for Christine Quinn. It was just incredible. She was amazing and all of that. But I had a horrible experience working for Cy Vance. Um, the two events that I did for him, um, I was one of three females in a room. And they were ask a lot of men were there asking questions. And you couldn't possibly get a word in edgewise. Like, it just it wasn't happening. And um, I was very frustrated, and I actually spoke to my uh, boss about it, and I said, you know, I, I actually don't like working for Cyrus Vance. I don't feel appreciated. I, it's not something I want to do. And after that, I didn't have to do any projects for him. But it was an interesting experience to be able to compare two politicians at the same time in terms of how they treated their staff. Um, and I don't know if it's just, you know, a personality trait of both of them, or if it was more of a, you know, male versus female leadership type of thing. But I definitely felt incredibly appreciated by Christine Quinn, and you know, she even called my parents after the internship to thank them for giving birth to me. So <laughs> it just, it was a phenomenal experience. Christine Quinn called her parents. Yeah, <laughs> they have the message saved awesome. on her voice. <laughs> so Dorothy, where's your shot? Uh, Total failure, or, or did your parents get called? That's that's our option here. I don't have anything like that to say. But um, I've done several internships while at Barnard, um, and I think the one I want to talk about is actually the internship I'm currently doing that I'm extending until the summer, um, until I find a job because they told me I can stay. Um, so I work at uh, NARAL Pro Choice New York, um, which is clear, it's a pro-choice political advocacy um, organization. Um, and I think working there, um, I really discovered what I love to do. Um, and I've had other internships where I figured out things I don't necessarily love to do or certain aspects that, you know, I really like. I figured out that I really like interacting with people. And if and I'm in an office by myself, I'm not going to be happy and I'm not going to work as hard as I do when I know that I'm going to be talking to my boss and checking in with her several times a day and that, you know, the other people that work in my department are going to come by and tell me, like, did you read this on the news? This is so exciting. And so working, um, I'm the political intern at NARAL Pro Choice New York, and right now what I'm doing, I'm working on, I was given a project all to myself where I'm working on um, uh, distributing the questionnaires that we use to figure out um, who we're going to endorse and how we're going to make our voting guide. And it's really exciting because I literally know every single person running for office in New York on uh, the state and on the federal level. And I've been able to interact with campaign managers who say, Ms. Kadar, like, hello, I would love if you would consider, and I, fe and I feel very important, and I know that I'm valued in the office, and I know that they appreciate what I do. And I think that's something what I've realized is that I, I need to be in an environment where I'm interacting with people, and I, and I know that's not always going to be the case where somebody's appreciating me to that extent, but it sure feels very nice. <laughs> and, and I know that what I want to do is I want to be in the game of politics, and I want to be talking to these people, and you know, I've called some office and assembly members have picked up and said, Dorothy, well, what do you think? They have no idea who I am, but they know that I'm calling from an organization and they want to hear what my opinion is if they should put up their name on this sign-on letter against uh, crisis pregnancy centers. And I sit there and I give my spiel and I've gotten confident on the phone, which is something Kitty talks about, how our generation doesn't know how to talk on the phone, <laughs> which is true because we don't have to ever. Um, so that's something I've battled at this internship and I now feel really confident on the phone and calling yes. whoever. And I've just made myself do it even though the entire office is quiet and I'm just like, everyone's listening to me. But it's really exciting and I think um, working there, I've really 
Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this um, because it's definitely hard to acquire a position like this, but I know that this is something I really love and I want to keep doing it. All right, so let's talk a little bit. I want to come back to a number of themes. I'm just going to, to note them so we can keep talking about them later on, but be before that I want to go on to the social action projects you did. But the two themes that seem really apparent in what you've talked about are uh, what it means to be appreciated in your job and to give appreciation. So I want to ask you at some point, little, let's save this question about whether that's a gendered concept, whether you think you feel differently than male colleagues in the same circumstance. And then the second thing I want to talk a little bit about is failure and resilience and how you built that in and how you learned, is that a learned phenomenon? Uh, so let's save those two questions and talk uh, next about the social action projects. Eva, I'm going to give you a pass on this because you haven't gotten there yet, but you will uh, very soon. Uh, but Renny, why don't we talk about yours? Sure. Uh, I did mine last March. Yes, last, no, two, Mar two Marches ago. Oh, boy. Two Marches ago. Anyway, it was a leadership workshop for women. Uh, I, throughout my young life in high school and then in college, I found that whenever I would go to these leadership gigs, uh, Hobie, Hugh O'Brien Youth Leadership Seminar, um, the National Outdoor Leadership School, those are things that, and Goldman Sachs Global Leaders, that was something that really inspired me and made me feel like I had the power to do anything. And kids need that. I mean, teenagers really need that. You need to tell a girl that you can do this and let me give you the skills to do it. That's, I felt like that was the largest impediment to young women, uh, especially who I saw. They had just a lack of confidence. They had such brilliant minds. And I'm, I'm talking necessarily about teenagers, about younger teenagers. So much potential, but no one to tell them that they were great. And that was my goal. So I created a, I guess it was closer to three to four hour leadership seminar. I worked with um, my father. He was a teacher in Staten Island. Uh, he brought 25 of his students in, and I tested it on them like little guinea pigs, and they loved it. Uh, they gave me great feedback. And then that grew, and I brought it I, with the help of uh, a couple other students. We brought it to South Africa for the, the women's um, symposium there and it was just a wonderful experience seeing my work come to fruition and seeing these girls understand how to stand up and where to put your feet in your hands when you're giving a public presentation um, and it was a it was a great experience and I continue to use it today I have a connection with the facing history schools and still go back to my dad's school and it's something that gives me a lot of pride and I definitely will continue to use it as well okay you want to explain a little bit about the components of what you, yeah, sure. what you do? Let's see. It's, um, it, it's basically a confidence bolstering slash public speaking uh, workshop. So you learn you know, words to say, words not to say. Um, when, you, when you're at the head of a table, never disclaim yourself. You never say, this might be a stupid question. Just little tricks of the trade that make a, a meek speaker a much better speaker and uh, you know who am I to tell these girls that but just through experience and through a lot of public speaking I felt that I had something to give. That's great. Uh, Dorothy. Yeah so I created a website uh, for my social action project which I actually just wrapped up um, in May so um, but I'm, I'm still working on it and it's um, a website called Girls Can Do. It's girlscando.webs.com we're switching to an actual domain name soon. <laughs> um, and so what it is, is it's a, it's a girls empowerment website um, that essentially highlights um, other women who um, talk about things they did when they were girls and moments when they struggled or you know, were picked on or teased because they thought, you know, um, the story that I keep talking about is you know, when I was in fourth grade, I walked into Miss Chastain's class wearing a t-shirt that said, someday a woman will be president. And then during recess, I was harassed by George Moscone, which was very <laughs> upsetting. Um, and, um, and just, we, I wanted to create a, a space. And with the internet, it's really exciting because you know, uh, this is for 10 year olds to 14 year olds. Um, they're on the internet all the time. This creates you know, a, a space, um, a discussion space where girls can talk to each other and reassure each other and say, you know what? 
you know, I have that t-shirt too, and you know, <laughs> don't listen to what he said, or read about a story that I wrote that, and then I say, but look what I'm doing now. I just graduated Barnard College, and now I'm looking for a job in politics, and one day I'm gonna be your senator, or something like that. Um, and so it creates a space for uh, girls to be reassured, and girls to talk about the things they're doing, um, any sort of like entrepreneurial things that they're pursuing, um, any new ideas they have, if they're running for class president or if they decided to try and join the football team, um, just different ways that girls are kind of challenging society and they can post about it and talk about it with each other. Um, and I have a series of bloggers who are from Barnard or um, other places where I have you know, friends from home who are posting these stories about uh, defiant things they did when they were 10 or 12 or 14 um, and how they challenged the idea of what girls can and can't do. So Dorothy, what are you gonna do with this uh, website since, um, since you made it? Well, it's still going, actually. Um, so it's still being posted. We're still having bloggers post on it. It's something I actually, it was my main procrastination tool during finals, so I really <laughs> like doing it. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna keep doing it now, especially um, I don't have a job lined up immediately. I wanted to take some time to really think about what I wanted to do. Um, and this is something I'm gonna be doing through that process, and I'm actually trying to get um, a domain name secured and actually pay for it and really invest my time and energy into this project because I really love doing it and my friends love participating. My sister's here and she actually made a blog post. And my cousin's here who's 12, who is the kind of person that I wanted to look and say like, look, like Grace, you can do this. Like, it doesn't matter that like, you know, they're selling these shirts now that are like, you're too pretty to do homework. Like that's <laughs> false. Everyone is pretty enough to do homework. Everyone do your homework. <laughs> um, so I wanted to set that example and really say like, look, like this is, you know, this isn't, what we should be talking about and not everybody has the opportunity of having parents who reassure them and say like no Dorothy keep doing that or they don't have the opportunity to come to a place like Barnard where they're you know, told like that's totally awesome and that's really cool and all my friends have done that and this is a way for girls across the country to connect with each other about that so I'm very excited. Terrific. Nina. Um, so I took a little bit of a different route. Um, I'm really involved with entrepreneurship. It's something that I love and I'm part of a community in New York City for that as well. So this was an opportunity to do my own startup. So I did. Um, I created a company called Kaiza. Um, it's basically a startup, it's fashion, um, that sells South Asian formal clothing, Indian clothing, um, but in the wedding sector, it's all formal wear. Um, to the United States, and it's basically an e-commerce site because one of the huge problems with buying formal South Asian wear is that it's almost completely not accessible to us here. Um, it's also extremely overpriced and it's really low quality. And so I was trying to figure out a way to bring really fashion forward designs that I would partially do myself and I'd go buy also from designers in India um, to a U.S. market, um, and especially starting on the East Coast, because there is a huge population, there's, a, there's actually a, a lot of money going into that market right now. Um, and so I did. Uh, I went to India in January. I did the project um, in the fall semester and basically spent the whole semester creating a business plan. And the social action portion was basically to have a profit sharing program where the women creating the clothing would also get um, equity in the company, so there was return that way, and they also have a self-sustaining um, form of pay. Uh, and basically, I went in January, I did a lot of shopping, I met a lot of factories and tailors, um, and I'm currently designing my first collection. I'm going on May 25th with my father um, to pick it up, and uh, uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm picking up the samples, and then in fall, I'm hoping to have a real line that I can sell you know, in quantity and in bulk um, by fall, so it would be a fall-winter collection um, in a few months. As you can see, we have incredibly accomplished uh, people uh, who go to Barnard, so it's, a, it's really a, been a pleasure to work with them. Uh, the last area I really wanted to talk about a little bit was your academic experience. What are the courses that you actually took as part of the Athena program? And uh, Rennie is a little different than everybody else mm -hmm. because she, she was new. The Athena program is only two Two, two full years old, yeah. So um, it's, it's been a work in progress as we go forward. But uh, I thought maybe Dorothy and Nina could talk a little bit about your coursework and what that meant, yeah. if anything. Um, well, for me, it's, uh, it's kind of funny that I was, I was really able to fulfill my requirements for the Athena program without really having to think about it um, because those were the kind of courses that I was interested in. 
I think as a political science major who focuses on you know gendered issues and women's leadership, just you know, one of the reasons why I applied to Barnard is that I saw there was an earlier leadership program that Barnard had that I was really excited about. And then as I've been here, it's just strengthened with the establishment of the Athena Center. So this really was something that I targeted Barnard because of it. Um, so here, I was always taking class, you know, race, gender, and the American political development. Um, women, in, women in leadership was a course that I really loved. Um, gender and the civil rights movement was one of my all-time favorite courses with Lisa Collins, who's a visiting professor, who's incredible. She teaches at Vassar. Um, so if anybody out there can either recommend that to someone or take it themselves, <laughs> you should do it. Um, where I just really learned, I think, I think learning about leadership, not necessarily taking all leadership classes, but I think historically for me, I, I love history. I look back and I think like maybe I should have been a history major. But um, looking back and being able to think about women who came before me and how they were able to lead, or, or men who came before me and how they were able to lead, and really processing that. Um, taking the American presidency with Richard Pius, um, who's my advisor and one of my favorite people at Barnard, um, and just really kind of synthesizing and processing the ways that different people in history have led, and how would you want somebody to be looking, I always think in this way, how would you want somebody to be looking back on you and studying you in a class and saying like, how did she lead, what did she do? And someone I always talk to Abigail about is Ella Baker, who was just like such an incredible leader who um, was part of the civil rights movement, part of uh, SNCC, and, but didn't necessarily lead in the way that we all think about it, in that very traditional, um, trajectory of leadership. She, she led by being you know, the voice behind everyone and by helping other people facilitate their own leadership um, and helping students organize. And I think that's something I learned about in my Women in Leadership course um, taught by Liz Abzug and also in uh, my Gender and Civil Rights Movement class. So I think there's, there's been so much overlap, but I think historically that's been the most beneficial for me and the most interesting. Eva. Um, well, I've not completed my course load, obviously, but um, two of the classes that really kind of shaped the way I view leadership and my experience at Barnard were uh, women in leadership that I took this last semester, um, where we really got to study you know, all the different types of leadership. And it was really eye-opening for me because I had gone into the class with a, my mother is what the class would define as a female chauvinist pig. Um, she, she's, you know, very much, she, she doesn't really understand why, you know, women need mentoring or anything like that because she did it, so why does anyone else need help? So I kind of went into the class with that mentality and completely changed after all of our discussions and, and readings, and it really definitely shaped my view of how leadership is, you know, it's fluid, it's not a sing singular defined type of, of Thing. And then the other class that really um, shaped my experience at Barnard also was exploring political leadership taught by Flora Davidson. Um, I'm a political science major, so that was basically exploring all the different presidents um, since Woodrow Wilson and how they led. And it was a really interesting course because there are no female presidents. So we were studying <laughs> we were studying a lot of men and then we tried to study different female leaders w while using different theories that were written based on male presidents. So it was really interesting to try to apply those theories that are, you know, really masculine to these female leaders and to see where these theories actually falter. And it was it was a really eye-opening experience for me, for sure. <laughs> Brenny, do you want to add anything here? You don't have to. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> Nina. Um, I think that I had a little bit of a different experience. My um, coursework was not centered around political science or history, um, but it was definitely more uh, centered around economics and more practical applications of leadership. And I had a similar situation to Dorothy in which I actually had finished my coursework um, that applied to the Athena Center before actually declaring myself as a scholar, and I kind of fell into it serendipitously. Um, and I think that that's really interesting because none of the courses that I put down as part of my Athena um, scholarship were for my major, but they were just things that I took out of complete interest, just electives that I'd already taken. And um, one of them, um, I, I took a ton of them that applied to the center, but one of my favorite classes was um, public speaking, actually. 
And that was the most uncomfortable class I have ever been in in my entire life. We were videotaped every single week and we had to watch it back with the entire class. Where, and everyone would give you feedback based on your speech every single time. And it was completely mortifying. Um, but it was the best experience at like college. I really think that that class should be a mandatory class for every single person. Um, because it doesn't teach you just how to public speak, but also just how to relate to people that you don't know and how to kind of get over that, um, that kind of initial embarrassment. And I think that those kinds of classes aren't um, necessarily like highlighted, but I think that in this program, you get an opportunity to kind of take them and to be rewarded for that, and there's incentive, and I think that that's a really amazing experience. And they teach you a completely different side of leadership um, than the pure academic or the theory-based work that we often do and think of as um, leadership. You know, we see examples of leadership in history, and you know, we know that we've done that in high school, and this kind of gives you a completely new view of how to apply it in situations where you know you find yourself after you graduate. All right, so that's a great segue into the last component I wanted to talk about, which is really the leadership labs, uh, our effort of teaching practical leadership skills. Um, and I'd like your thoughts about that. Randy, why don't we start with you? Uh, the leadership labs were probably the most influential portion of the Athena Center to me. Um, one of my, it, it was called Getting to the Gravitas, and it was taught by uh, Raleigh Mayer. And we are still in communication. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. And she helped me to create my seminar, my workshop. And she offers me jobs here and then. I mean, it was a really, truly one of I mean, very, very impactful for me. I, it, I always knew what these skills were, but I never could put a name to it. And then all of a sudden, you know, in a couple of hours, she just defines these things for me. She defines how to give a great public presentation with four to-do lists. I mean, it was just so practical. And, you know, I'm a history major. What do I ever study? I study about theories and, you know, in the past. And this was the first time that I got hands-on, you know, skills so it was fabulous and it was definitely one of my favorite parts of, about this program so dorothy yeah um the leadership labs i would say for me um a lot of what i learned in the leadership labs are things that i'm able to take back and when i'm in a situation i'm able to think like okay you need to do this because you learned xyz and one of my favorite examples is um I think it was, I'm not sure exactly which, I think it was like the art of selling yourself, but mm -hmm. it was about like self-promotion and how to be like your biggest fan. Um, and one of the things we, we learned about was the idea that, this is something I've been thinking about a lot since I'm applying for jobs, is that women won't apply for a job unless they feel like they have 100% of the qualifications listed on um, the posting. But a man will apply if he has like 50% or something outrageous like that. So now, every time I'm looking at a job posting, and I see myself and I'm like, oh, well, my Excel skills are like, okay, but they're not excellent like they say here. And, you know, sitting there doing that. And I, and I sit there and I talk to myself and I'm like, Dorothy, just send in your stuff. Write your cover letter. You know it's going to be good. Just, just do it. Just, it's okay if you're not completely comfortable with, you know, XYZ software that they say you need to know because you know you can learn it. You know you could go to the job and you could figure it out because you're smart. And I have to sit there and talk the, and talk myself through this. And this is actually a difficult thing. And, and I'm not someone where I sit there and say like, oh, I have like a really hard time, you know, talking to people about myself or trying to network or things like that. Barnard's really prepared me for that. But this program has really given me those skills where I sit there and I say, okay, Dorothy, when you're introducing yourself, you don't want to do those things like running the thing where you're like, well, this was my idea, but yours sounded better, but here it goes. Like, no, you want to sit there and you want to say your idea and you want to be confident about it. Um, and also, we had to do an activity where you had to say something you were proud of and you write it down on paper, and then we didn't know this was going to happen. They pulled you up and said, okay, so now announce it in front of everybody. I didn't know who the women were who were in this lab with me and I you know said something I was invited to like the women in public service event that Barnard did and uh, Hillary Clinton was one of the speakers and I was really proud of myself for being a part of that but I said it in front of everybody and I was like I did this it was cool I met Hillary Clinton she was like all right sit down you're gonna now come up and talk about someone you're really proud of talk about something someone you're really proud of and how would you talk about them and I got up and I started talking about my sister and I was like my sister so amazing blah 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 and I like was like really confident and so exciting and saying all these things and she was like 
Why was that different? Why were you able to talk so confidently about your sister, someone you really care about and feel confidently about, but for you, it was, it was a struggle and you didn't want to do that. You need to speak with that confidence about yourself that you would say about your mom or your best friend or your sister or your dad. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are the things that I've really loved about the leadership labs or it really does give you the practical skill set where as a woman, um, trying to navigate the workforce now and trying to navigate actual practical forms of leadership in the world, you can sit there and, and try to correct yourself these things that have been ingrained. Eva. Um, one of the most influential leadership laps for me was uh, negotiating your salary because I was given a stipend for one of my internships, but it was just, it didn't even cover, you know, getting my Metro card every day. It was just, it was absurd. So I had to, you know, negotiate um, to get a little bit more money just so I could get back and forth between my house and the, and the job. And it was, it was a really good um, lab for me because I, at first, just didn't want to say anything to my boss. But it was easy once I spoke to my boss. I just said, I'm sorry, I just, I don't have enough money. And she was just like, oh, it's fine. Like, it's really, it's not a big deal. And so I was so afraid beforehand, but the leadership lab kind of made me realize that you just need to, whatever you need to say, it's, you're not going to offend someone by saying it. It's a practical thing that everyone needs to go through in a career, in any kind of job. And it's just, you kind of need to just grin and bear it and learn how to deal with it in a professional way. Um, I kind of have like two mini examples of how leadership labs have impacted my life. Um, I think that they're, by the way, on a personal note, amazing because, no really, because honestly, your college you know, education is really theory-based. I mean, you spend so much time analyzing hundreds and hundreds of pages of readings. You spend all of this time absorbing information, and then you get to a job where none of it seems useful, and you're like, <laughs> what am I doing? Um, and I think that these really give you an opportunity to learn skills that you never would have otherwise. And two of those skills that I've learned, one was negotiating the salary, so when you said that, I thought of that. Um, when I was uh, applying for fashion jobs, which was a complete pain in the butt, I went on 25 in-person interviews in six weeks and it like completely took over my life um, and I accepted the sax job um, and it was a really exciting time for me and I remember them saying that um, I think it was yeah like most women I think over 70 percent or something don't negotiate their first salary out of college um, where more men do and so I remember that and so I picked up the phone to the HR manager and I was like you know what, like this base salary is great, it's a, it's a program, so they give everyone the same salary. So I knew there was no negotiating that. But I was like, what else can you give me? Because quite <laughs> frankly, like, like I'm awesome, you know, like what, you know, what else can you give me? So basically, I was like not afraid, I was like, you know what, I'll find a job, like whatever, you know? And um, I was like, let's try it. And it was my first time negotiating any kind of benefits. But I ended up with two more months um, out of college, which in fashion they hired the next day. It's like almost impossible to get. So I'm now starting at the end of July, and I have like a mini vacation that I've never had because um, I've worked every summer. And um, I got some extra other benefits, like you know, in terms of health and you know, plans, medical plans, and things like that. And it was great. You know, I got something. Like it was awesome, <laughs> and uh, it was really exciting, and it worked. So that was a great um, piece of advice that I got from my labs. And the second thing was I took a class. Uh, I think it was my sophomore year, junior year, called on um, the basics of entrepreneurship, and it was the first time the class was being taught. And um, it was great, it was taught by Vanessa Wilson, who um, is part of Golden Seeds. It's this angel investing firm run by women who um, basically they fund entrepreneurs entrepreneurship, like startups basically run also by women. And the board of the companies that are applying for these um, funds have to be three-fifths women. So they have to be women-run companies. And it's really interesting because she was really blunt. And I really needed that before I was doing my own project because she basically told us that women often ask for less money in front of VC firms. So when you're going up there and you're doing your pitch, you're often females ask for less money. And she was like, go ask for what you need, you know? And also she kind of said, know your stuff, which is the nicer word of what she actually said. But she basically <laughs> was like, don't go up there and not know your numbers. You know, do your research, know the market, know how much money you're talking about. Because at the end of the day, a lot of women falter when you're in front of you know these big VC firms and they're 
grilling you about the questions. You know, how much is the market? How much are you going to take of it? What are your plans? Like, how come you did this? And she was like, don't be afraid. You know, get up there, say, you know, I'm taking a billion dollars out of this $8 billion market. Here's why, you know, this is going to work. And um, I really needed that kind of confidence and knowledge about the market that I was going into before I did my own startup. So that was really helpful, and I'm really thankful for that experience. Great. All right, so let's come back to those questions I put on the side a little <laughs> earlier. Uh, one had to do with gender in, in leadership and, and what difference that makes. Uh, and I think, you know, in some ways I'm asking you to comment a little bit about the value of a women's college. Mm -hmm and what that means and how you approach uh, gendered workplaces. Uh, and so I'd, uh, let's let's go back to that initial question. Rennie, you're shaking your head. You go first. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> I'm out of school, and I'm in the, the real world, whatever that means. Um, and I've had, oh my god, I've had three, four, I've had four jobs. They're overlapping, and I have still have multiple. But they're all women. All my bosses have been women. I mean, general manager of a restaurant, the vice president of development, Name it, it's a woman. Is it, is, you know, do I feel, in college I felt that men and women maybe had very different leadership styles and now as in the real world with lady bosses, I still find that sometimes I'm not acknowledged or you know, I, I, don't, I don't see what their leadership style is or I see that it's all about them, they're not trying to motivate me. Then again, I have other great bosses. But in terms, my view on the gender of of leadership has, has certainly changed in a way. And I'm seeing that it's more about the person that you are. That being said, I think it was great that I went to Barnard at an all women's college because it made me stronger in who I am as myself because I got, I just, you know, I feel like Barnard is a place where you meet a lot of like-minded ladies who are just passionate and want to succeed and will strive. And that really just bolstered my confidence and my ability to do a lot of things and, uh, and to have uh, confidence in my leadership capabilities. But in the real world, when you are dealing with a difficult boss, you go back to yourself and you remember what you want and what kind of leadership style you have and you make friends with them and you get them to love you and then you just wor work up the chain. So it's been, a <laughs> it's been a great experience having some difficult bosses, others more difficult than the other, but it's, I don't know, it's not a man-woman thing in my mind anymore. Dorothy? I think, um, well, first of all, I've working in um, the realm of reproductive rights and women's mm -hmm. rights, you know, I kind of have a very different idea of what, you know, bosses and leadership and internships and that experience. Um, but I, I do have to say that I think, I don't necessarily think it's a situation of whether you have like a male boss or a female boss and how they lead. I think the idea of leadership is gendered in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And when people fall into roles of leaders, they get the idea of how they have to be and that it's a very gendered, male-dominated um, perception of leadership. And I think that's the problem. So I don't think it really matters whether it's a man or a woman doing the leading. I think the idea of leading itself is gendered and is kind of based around this idea of if you want to be a real leader, you have to take on X, Y, Z characteristics, mm -hmm. which have been based off of hundreds of years of male leadership. Um, so I think that's something that actually has to be broken down, and obviously this is me being all like, I love gender studies. And, um, <laughs> but I think that's more important in that we have to figure out how to value leadership differently. Because then I think when you fall into a role of leadership, what the, the go-to is to follow these kind of, these things that you've learned all throughout your life. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be the leaders you've had as an intern or at this boss it's you know summer jobs I worked in a store when I was like in high school and I had a boss who was really really rude to me and he he owned the chain of stores and you know he kind of he could do that because he owned the stores but he you know I'd be folding t-shirts and he'd come up to me and be like why don't you fold those like you care about your job and he you know was not nice to me and I quit so you know <laughs> there are certain things you can do and I can take that into mind and yes you know I don't want to open up a chain of boutique t-shirt stores for tweens which is what I was working in <laughs> um, but, but what I do want to do is I want to be a leader and I never want to make someone feel like that yeah. and I think that that is a very gendered way of leading and I think that women take on that as well um, so I think it's really important to take those things into mind when you're becoming a leader yourself and even we will be starting in entry level jobs as assistants but you know something we talked about in our senior seminar is that as assistants you're most likely going to be the person in charge of interns and how to process that and how 
that's making you a leader and you're making this experience for other young men and young women and it's up to you to create that experience and to change it and to break the chain of this kind of leadership. So I think it's just, you have to be very aware the entire time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rita, you want to add anything? Yeah, um, I think that working in um, retail is a really different experience than what I was used to interning, you know, for the Athena Center, um, who is very aware of how they treat their interns. Um, <laughs> but uh, especially at Chanel specifically, I, it's mostly women. Honestly, like the only men at Chanel is like Carl Lagerfeld and his assistant. Like oh. it's like really kind of crazy. There was like one man I think I had an interaction with the whole summer. Um, and so I can't really speak to um, you know, the different styles of leadership in terms of how they would treat me, but I can say that I found it really interesting to see what leadership qualities my different bosses took on. So I was an intern and I had eight different bosses for each product category and I was the only intern on the floor and I reported to them all equally and had no real boss. And so that was a really crazy kind of experience. Um, but it was really interesting to me to see how each of them motivated me to do their work or didn't motivate me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that a lot of them tried to be uh, more male in terms of their leadership and that's kind of what you were speaking to um, in terms of you know, gendered leadership. I think that they were trying to be what they thought um, a, a you know tough boss would be and what a masculine boss would be um, and a lot of times it did not work because the people who were the best at leading and were the best bosses for me were the people who were just themselves and who were able to talk to me like a human being um, and who were just able to relate on a very personal level and I think that that was a really important skill that I took on um, and I think it's going to be really interesting to translate that into real life because the rotational program I'm going into, I'm going to get a new boss every 30 days. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if you talk to me in a year, I'll have a different perception on how different genders, you know, relate to their, um, to their subordinates. I think it's an interesting process. Eva? Um, well, one of the things that I tried to, or I tried to do throughout all my internships is to try to find a mentor because I think that your boss is not always your mentor. And I think that it's a really important um, thing to ha do while you're interning because you learn the most from that one-on-one -on -one interaction when someone really wants to motivate you to get ahead and, and all of that. And so what I kind of discovered was not that I gravitated towards female mentors necessarily, but I gravitated towards mentors that really cared, uh, were knowledgeable about the field first and foremost, and then also like really cared about um, motivating me to do more outside of just what I was assigned to do as an intern. And so um, my freshman year, um, I worked at Working Families Party, and my mentor there was this um, man, Peter Kim, who was in charge of all the interns. And he, he definitely motivated me to go above and beyond what my responsibilities were. And, um, I ended up, you know, organizing one of their first events in Queens that they had never done before just because of the motivation that I got from him. And then um, when I worked at Reed Street Strategies, I'd have to say Christine Quinn was definitely a mentor there. Um, I remember one time she just invited me into her office for lunch and then just said, asked me, oh, so what do you want to do with your life? And it was just one of those questions that really threw me for a loop. But it was, it was a really amazing experience to have people that are really knowledgeable about their field and also like really want to motivate you to get ahead. And I think that that is the kind of leadership that I really uh, value and I don't know if it's necessarily gendered. Okay. So the last question, uh, the, the, the other issue we reserved was really one about, well, let me just say, I think one that President Obama talked about yesterday, which is he, he termed it uh, perseverance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think of it as resilience, that is the, the continuing on when things aren't going so well. Um, what's your thoughts about that and what, what can we pass on to the next group of uh, Barnard students about that? I've learned a lot about perseverance this year. I think graduating from Barnard, I was on the top of the world, and then all of a sudden you're in real life, and you're like, oh my God, I'm a cat sitter. What is happening to me right now? <laughs> um, but you know, <laughs> it's a true story. Um, I, you know, I, I was cat sitting, I was dog sitting, I was editing videos, I was working for these crazy ladies in a record company. You know, now I'm at the ASPCA, I was working in a restaurant. I mean, I was all over the place, and I had no idea what I wanted to do. I'm still in muddy waters, but it was, 
I know I had my friends and I had, but most importantly, I had this sense of self that I really got from Barnard. When I arrived here as a first year, I had no idea who I was or what I wanted to do, so now I'm in the second phase of that. Um, but it, I, I learned that no matter what you're doing, do it well. Because if you do it well, you will get noticed. And if you do it well and you get noticed, then people will recommend you for things. They'll call you back. And that was a really important lesson that I've learned this year about perseverance. It's just getting through the cat sitting to you know, become a, a higher level of person, exactly. Eva? Um, I guess one of the things that, that really I guess stuck with me um, throughout the, my whole time at Barnard, I guess, is just the idea of even if you're in a horrible, tough situation that you have the confidence in yourself and you know your abilities and you know what you're capable of doing and, and that should be your motivation even if the job market is awful and you don't get the internship you want, which happened to me. Um, I had this dream of, you know, being at the Clinton Foundation and I put it off for two years applying and I got rejected uh, this year and I was devastated. But then I found the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance and it was just, I, I was meant to be there is really what it was. But, you know, if I had given up, I wouldn't have found where I should be right now. And so I think that that was a lesson that when I was watching Obama speak, I really connected with. And he was also really genuine about it too, which was amazing. But I just think that that's something that Barnard teaches you because <laughs> I, and I was so upset and I went to Abigail and I was like, I don't know what to do, everything is awful. And <laughs> she was like, everything's gonna be fine. Like you weren't meant to be there, it's really okay. <laughs> so I think that you know, people, people like that, that you find at Barnard and just those, those kinds of, of lessons that you learn here is what really will help you throughout your entire lifetime. So I, I must note that the Abigail that keeps being referred to is <laughs> here in the audience, Abigail Lewis, who is our, uh, runs the scholars program for the Athena Center and uh, is well loved by many of our students. So or probably most of our students, probably all of our students. Yeah. Oh, let me, let me see. Okay. Uh, failure, resilience, persistence. Um, I think the most uh, important thing that I learned about failure, um, you should all know that like, okay, so I did Chanel, right? I mean, like it was an awful <laughs> experience, but I feel like, yeah, there has to be like a nice ending to this story. Um, and there is, uh, you know, I kind of like, my most important point about failure is to not be ashamed to do it again and to do it right. Mm. Um, and that's kind of what I did. And that's really what I learned from that experience. I went back to HR and I was like, listen, I had an awful time in this department. Like I needed a new internship. And I worked, um, you know, three days a week, the fall semester of my senior year in visual merchandising for fine jewelry. It was a completely different department. It was a completely different group of people. And I like sucked it up. And I had the best internship I ever had. It's the reason why I'm going into luxury goods. I absolutely loved my boss. And I think that, you know, yeah, maybe it was a difference in terms of that team. And they work completely differently. They're a cohesive team. They talk a lot. There's a lot of dialogue. And that's great that I happen to fall into that. But I also completely changed how I approached the situation. I didn't crawl back um, like I wanted to or like never show up again. Um, you know, I kind of like put on my big girl pants and you know, I called every, every anybody who would possibly talk to me in that company got an email from me. If I found out your email address, I emailed you for coffee, for lunch. And you know what? Three people responded out of like the 50 emails that I sent out. But I had coffee with three people. I am LinkedIn friends with them. And, you know, I talk to them still. And I'm going to be working on Fifth Avenue a block away from them. And it's probably likely that I will run into them in the street. And I think that, you know, doing that was a completely horrifying experience. But it was the best one I've ever had. And I think I came out better for it. So um, in terms of perseverance, I think that, you know, it's okay to do it again. It's okay to get it wrong on the first time, which a lot of us have a lot of trouble with, yeah. you know, even yeah. admitting that we did it badly. Um, and I think that learning to do it again was a really important experience for me. Dorothy. Uh, yes. Um, so I think uh, something at Barnard that you learn, um, and this is more academic, is that, you know, everybody wants to be the best. Everyone wants to get the highest grade. <laughs> There are a lot of people who will take certain classes because they know that that's what they're good at and that's what they're sticking to. And I think something I really learned at Barnard is that you should choose the classes that you might not do the best in mm -hmm. and that you should take 
you should take the professors who are known to be really, really hard. And not all the time, don't take five of those classes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, sit there and it's okay that if you consistently you know, aren't getting the A plus in that course, and I, I know that this is probably, you know, this is something we're trying to teach people, you know, in elementary school, but I really think that, you know, sitting there and, you know, my major wasn't necessarily, political science wasn't composed of all the courses that I necessarily always consistently did the best in. Mm -hmm. It was continually challenging for me. And, you know, once I conquered one level, I went on to the other. And I, you know, in the fall, I took a graduate level course at SEPA that was very challenging for me. But I knew that I wanted to take it and I knew that it would help me taking it. Was it the best thing for my GPA? I don't know, but I know that it was, I think that it's really important to notice that sometimes not doing the best and maybe failing, not actually an F, but maybe you know, not necessarily doing your best at something is good. And that you can't be you know, constantly, th there's no point if you're consistently going to be doing the best at things and, and getting the highest grades and uh, you know, being the best person at your internship. If you're not suffering, if you're not doing the, those nights where you're sitting there with a book where you're like, I don't understand this, I don't get it. If you're not going through that process of teaching yourself to reread it, reread it again, take notes, have somebody read it, try to explain it to each other, you know, that's what you're really getting from it, learning. And kind of the perseverance of learning is what I really battled with at Barnard, was just trying to sit there and be like, no, I'm gonna take this on. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, Barnard, you know, there was perseverance in my internships where I had to learn, like, you know what, figuring out how to send a package to the Gambia filled with, you know, reports for the Human Rights Court was very hard. <laughs> that took me a very long time. <laughs> but I did it, and I figured it out, and that was perseverance. But I think more so was just sitting there and saying, like, no, I'm going to keep signing up for this course. That professor isn't super fond of me, but he's going to be by the end of this second course I take with him. And, you know, I did stuff like that. I don't think everyone does, but for me it was really important to sit there and say, like, no, like, I'm here for a reason. I'm here for a reason. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep doing these readings. I'm going to go to their, you know, I'm going to make these professors know me. I'm going to sit in their office hours and ask them questions until I feel like I understand. And I think that's something not everyone takes advantage of. And you really need to, you know, put your foot down and say, like, teach me. Like, I need to learn. I want you to help me. And you can do the same thing with your bosses and with your mentors. You can show up and say, you know what? Like, I made that cover, that letter you wanted me to write. I know you didn't like it. Let's sit down. Help me figure out what did you want? What did you mean? Help me understand. And really admitting fault and asking for help is better. Kitty was saying in our senior seminar, like you would rather somebody come up to you and say, what do you really want? than do it the first time and have them be like, no, this is not what I wanted. You know, going up to the person and asking like, what is this? Like, please teach me. And, and noticing that you can learn from the people around you, even if they aren't your biggest fan, you can, you can turn them. So. All right, well, I want to thank an illustrious group of uh, leaders that we have here today. There is an ice cream social, I think, next door in Salzburger Parlor, and we invite you all there, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.